We appreciate you today. God's good, so good to us. I want you this morning, if you would, to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 46. And I want to talk to you today about an area that I feel is something of importance to us. I've been preaching a lot about the blood, and we're going to pick back up and carry on with that as always because I want to give you some better answers or more information on answers to what we're facing today. But I want to talk today about I will carry you. Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll get into Scripture. Father, we thank you today. And Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, we thank you for being our guide, our one that carries us, Lord, the one who provides for us and makes a way. We place our trust in you today. Pray you have me behind your cross, Lord. Anoint these words and let them ears to hear and hearts to receive. In Jesus, my name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Isaiah 46 and 4 says, And even to your old age, I am he, and even to whore hairs which I carry you, I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. Now I want to just say that word whore hairs is talking about gray hairs. I can officially say I'm a gray hair. Been that for a few years. I went to the barber, got a haircut, told him to cut all the gray off. They said, so you want me to shave your head? I said, well, let's keep a little of the gray then. But as we get older, we begin to gray and we become what the many would call antiques. That's what that word actually is talking about. That this aged and old. Uh, I looked the word up because I wasn't sure it didn't seem to fit. But that's, that's the meaning of this word in particular, the way it's used. It's talking about as we age, as we become antiques or older versions, older models of what we are with that gray hair. Well, I can tell you today, it's an honor and a blessing to live to be old long enough to have gray hair. Amen. And many of you, thank God, they have died. And you don't have to have gray hair because you can die. I tried that recent formula one time for men, and I just didn't feel right. I just did, it didn't look like my hair, and I said, I can't do this. But if I was, you know, I mean, that's everybody's case. I'm not for or against. I, I don't care what you do as far as your hair, but I'm going to say if you want to put a little dye in there, ain't nothing wrong with that. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. You're like, I don't believe there's any problem putting makeup on. My pastor used to always tell folks, and they'd get grappling. Out, he said, every barn looks better with a little paint on it. Come on. Notice I didn't say old barn. <laughs> we, we have to realize this, this. We live our life from a child as a baby. Uh, you know, I see my little granddaughter, and she's just she's stretching, and just, you know, and I'm thinking, have mercy, you know, she's just a little tiny thing. How does she even know to do the things she knows to do already? Uh, but she depends on us, though, for everything. If she gets wanting a bottle, you can tell. We start, we know that. And she's not real fussy and crying a lot. She's a very quiet baby. We're not used to that because our three children squalled all the time. But John Ray has just been like the perfect baby. But we know there's needs. We had to prepare. We make a way. And we plan for, you know, she's fixed to want to eat in here in a little bit. We can start getting things ready. We wash the bottles, do the things that are needed, you know. And we're just having a blast with her there. And like I say, it's the greatest privilege in the world to be a grandparent. Because if she does get fussy, I just hand her back to her mom. <laughs> we got plenty of arms around the house. Everybody's taking turns. But I want to talk to you today about the fact that as a child... You began to trust your parents to provide for you. And you began to learn to have faith. You know, as children, a lot of times, we don't even think about eating or having food. We just think it's going to be there. We don't realize mom and dad has to make a way to provide those things. And, of course, today, you know, my children way more spoiled than I was. When I was a kid, you got something on Christmas and your birthday. Anything in between, you thought you were in hog heaven. I mean, if we got a ball or something, we thought we were in hog heaven. I'll never forget one time my, my dad had bought me a baseball mitt and bat and glove, 
and uh, football, and I thought, I didn't know what had happened. I was like, did I miss something? It's Christmas, and it's the middle of summer. We just didn't get a lot of things because people didn't have the money like they do now, and we were more accustomed. So when we talk about somebody's being spoiled, we often don't realize they're only spoiled because they're used to what? Giddy. It, somebody's not spoiled if they don't know. If you don't know how good a steak is, you don't miss eating steak. If you, if you like cottage cheese and that's all you ever eat, bless your heart. <laughs> eating air. No taste whatsoever, just air. People, first thing people say, yeah, but with peaches, it's wonderful. Yeah, you're eating peaches. <laughs> if you only ate cottage cheese and peaches, then you wouldn't realize how good some banana pudding is. Mm, I better shut up. I won't be able to preach. Y'all get up and leave and go eat lunch. Some of you got that look on your face right now. You don't miss what you don't realize you have if you've never had it. You as a child of God, sometimes we get spoilt because God intervenes and gives us the things we need and then we become little brats. Come on. Because we expect every time we cry out to God that we should get exactly what we want. We've been accustomed to that by our parents. We've, we've been taught that many of us, or many of you and many folks have been taught in their Christian life. God's an ATM bank. Every time you need something, just come to God. Every time you want something, just cry out to God. Well, the fact is, God wants us to cry out to Him when we don't need something. Come on. When we're not in need, when we're not hungry, when we're not lacking something, when it's not need for a miracle. But as a pastor for 25 years, I've noticed that a lot of people only reach out to God when they're in need. There's no relationship there. There's no thankfulness. I tell you, I'm thankful today. And the things that I don't have, it's all right. Because you know what? I'm not used to having those things. Come on. I don't, I don't have to be spoiled. I don't want to be spoiled. I want to be somebody who's grateful for everything that God gives me. And any time you begin to be ungrateful, you should stop and realize you could be in a worse place than you are right now. God provides, God makes a way, and as you live your life for God, the Lord wants to continue to increase your faith. And as your faith grows, guess what? God can do more in your life. Many times, the lack of faith to believe that God's going to intervene will cause you to be afraid to do what God has called you to do or is moving in your situation. The more difficult situation, the more you need God, so that means you must be dependent on Him. But I'm going to tell you, if my child only loves me and only calls me daddy when they want something, guess what? I ain't God. I'm talking about me. You know what I do? I start going, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, you love me now. You need some money, don't you? <laughs> oh, you don't ever text me, but all of a sudden I'm getting text. I know what's coming next. You want something. That's the way God sees a lot of Christians. Come on. Why? Because the only time I'm going to cry out to God is when I, I make it on my own. I'll do it my way. And then you're going to do it your way. And what you're going to do is find out doing it your way is putting faith in yourself. When you and I know that people are successful, but my friend, as a Christian, my success rests in the hands of God and my faith that He's going to provide. Come on. We don't have to be successful in the eyes of men. Being successful in the eyes of God is when we have faith to believe that no matter what I encounter, God's going to make a way. Here He says, even when you get old... I'm going to carry you. I'm going to make a way for you. I'm going to provide for you. And I know as I get older, I look at retirement or getting older, just worrying about finance. What am I going to do? I don't want to end up eating cat food and all this kind of stuff. Come on, you didn't thought that. You're not getting old yet. How am I going to survive when I get older? What am I going to do? Well, you know what? When you are saved, what we should do is trust God and say, you know what? I don't know what exactly is going to take place, but I'm going to trust God, and I know He's going to provide a way because His Word says He will provide and make that way. 
He's going to bring about what needs to be done in my situation, and I can be trust and know that's the truth. Psalms 118 and 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in who? Man. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be, what? Safe. Shall be safe as we trust God. Isaiah 14 and 3 says, And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou hast made to serve you may have gone through difficult times in your life, but my friend, your faith in God has brought you through it. And if He brought it through you once, He'll bring you through it again. But you got to keep believing and trusting. That means God knows that I'm the real deal. That means I'm not just praying when I have a need, but I'm praying all the time. I'm just not giving Him praise when He done something for me. I'm giving Him praise all the time because whether He does anything or not, He's still worthy to be praised because He's the creator of all the universe. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I'm telling you, He is our Bama Gilead. He is our healer and our deliverer. He is the one who deserves praise today and glory forever and ever. So in my time, as I walk with the Lord and I grow older, I should grow wiser. Gray hair is supposed to be because you get wiser. 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 Why should I be? How can I be wise? As a wise person, I should know who has blessed me. Now, I'm, going, I'm just going to say there are certain people in my life who have been good to me. And I recognize those people. In my, but you know what? I understand that they have given to me or done for me in times when nobody else would have. Come on. So it's hard to get mad with that person. It's hard to say, you know what? That person just don't love me. And you thought, well, you know what? That person has done a lot for me. Well, every time you get walking and things are going bad and the devil says, you know what? God don't love you. You need to stop and say, you know what? You are stinking liar. You matter of fact, the Bible says you're the father of lies and you're a thief. You will not rob my joy because I know that God is on my side. He's provided in the past and he'll provide again today. He'll make a way. He'll give me whatever it is that is needed because he is a God that is able and also what more than able to provide everything required. My faith in him. My faith in knowing that God loves me and cares about me. That doesn't always mean I get everything I want. Well, you know, I wanted a new car and I didn't get one. You know how many people I've had prayed for over the years that came and said, Brother Rod, I want you to pray for me because I want this new car. And I need this car. I want to pray with me, agree with me. I said, all right, let's pray, Lord. Bless them. Help them, you know, give them whatever it is, Lord. And ask you just to move on their behalf. And then six months later, they come back, Brother Mitchum, I want you to pray with me. I said, what do you want me to pray about? I want you to pray that I can sell that car. Why? I can't afford that car. I need out of this thing. Well, you know what? I should have just prayed from the beginning. Lord, let them have it if, they, if it's in your will. If not, don't let them get it. And then you know what they'd probably say to me? That ain't the kind of prayer I want. But brother, you as a child of God should always want the will of God in everything that you do. It was buying a car, buying a house, buying a pair of shoes. The will of God and all that we do. I remember... <laughs> Years ago, I, uh, I had a preacher, I told you about this, but the preacher gave me some alligator shoes. And they weren't the right size. I wore a 12 double wide. But I got wide feet. But I, I couldn't turn down them gaiters even though there's 11 or 11 and a half. I st put, stretched my foot in them gaiters and I wore them anyway. He said, you won't ever have to do nothing but put a pair of soles on them shoes. You know what I did? I busted a hole in the side of them shoes because I walk on the side of my feet. I did have holes in the bottom and I would get my socks wet. But brother, when people look at them gaiters, they thought I was rolling in the dough. Come on. When I had
had them alligators, I had a big old Brom Cadillac my mama was getting rid of, and I bought that thing. It was like riding down the road in a, on a sofa. Stretch your arm out across that seat. Y'all remember how them seats used to be? Oh, man, that thing ride like a dream. Now, parking it was like parking one of these big old trucks. But it was a great ride down the interstate. I mean, folks thought, man, that young preacher's doing good. He's driving that big old Cadillac, got them alligator shoes on. And guess what I was doing? I was making $100 a week, pastoring the church, living in the Sunday school room, and having to fight roaches every night when I went to bed. I promised them roaches get so loud sometimes I thought they were having a soccer game down there. I turned the lights on. I sprayed them, got rid of them. But you know what? What looks like everything's perfect doesn't always make you the thing what people think. Come on. But you know what? So trying to pretend like you love God and oh, I'm a faithful man. I love the Lord. What you really are, you just a poor guy you driving a used Cadillac with an old pair of alligator shoes somebody else gave you with a hole in the side of them and holes in the bottom when you got wet socks when it rains. Every time it rains, you feel bad, you get mad, you bully grub, you talk about God. Oh, God, where are you? I'm telling you, He's right where He's always been, on the throne of glory. And He is there to do a miracle for you and to work on your behalf. But you have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to be a part-time man of God. I'm not going to be a part-time woman of God. I'm going to stand believing no matter what that God is in control. And I'm going to believe Him even when it looks impossible that God is going to make a way and when the world says you're a fool I say so do they say that about Elijah but I can tell you why God brought the fire hallelujah I can tell you they said that about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego but God delivered them out of that fiery furnace I can say they said that about Daniel but he brought him out of that lion's den God will bring you through whatever you're facing but you must be faithful to continue to give him praise in the good times and even the bad. I've told this, but many years ago I had a motorhome. And I was traveling, doing some evangelism. And I was listening to this preacher on TV, on radio, excuse me, right down the road. And he said, you know, one time I had a motorhome. And he said, I realized that I didn't own that motorhome. That motorhome owned me. I was like, what does he mean? He said, it costs so much to keep that motor home. He said, every time I turn around, it was so expensive, I was so glad to get rid of it. I heard another guy just the other day, he said, the two happiest times for somebody owns a boat, the day he gets it and the day he sells it. <laughs> and I, I got that motor home. I was going back to Florida to do some preaching. And me and Stacy loaded up. I think she was pregnant that time with Lindsay, and we had Kirsten put her in her little seat, and we was all rolling down the road, and I was going down that road, and I used to be a truck driver, so I'm, I'm hammering down. You know, most motorhomes are barely going, not me. I got to go. We're going down that country road, go around the curve. Stacy said, you better slow this thing down. In just a little while, I told her, don't worry about it. I got this woman. I didn't say woman because she would have taken me out right then. I got this, babe. <laughs> and she said, I got you, babe. That's a whole different deal there. So <laughs> some of you will get that after lunch. So we're going down the road all of a sudden. I'm, I'm flying down the road, come around the curb, front tire right under me blows out. Boom! All of a sudden, that motor home goes to the left side of the road, and I pull it back to the right, and we had just passed some log trucks. I'm telling you, it was a miracle of God that we did not die that day on that road, but God allowed, even though that tire blew out, He didn't let it blow out when them log trucks were right there in that left lane. We called somebody, they come out, and they fix us where we could limp into a, Tire place down in Beaumont. We hadn't even got very far. We was living up around like Livingston at the time. And I was like, man, I need to get this tire fixed. I promise you. The man was standing there talking to me. 
And as he was telling me they got that tire fixed, another tire blew out on that motorhome. No, that ain't the end of the story. They kept blowing out. I almost had to replace every tire on the motorhome, and I can tell you something. I'm just about to lose it. I'm about to lose it. I'm when God, how can I afford this? We ain't gonna have gas to get there now. I gotta buy these tires. I didn't have no credit card. If I did, didn't have anything on it, but owed. <laughs> so I'm gonna pay the cash I had in my pocket. Nothing. But you know what? Then we had to stop and realize. Well, God spared us from running into those log trucks. What if there was a great wreck down the road we didn't know about, but God hold us back until it was time for us to roll? And I began to have a better perspective and say, you know what? Thank you, Lord. And you know what, Lord? I needed to buy them tires anyway. Come on. Should have bought them before we went on the trip. But I thank you that you made and prepared and gave us the opportunity and saved us from potentially maybe being in a wreck. How many times do you leave the house and you're, you get up early but you're still late? And you get mad. I don't know how many people pass sometime early in the morning they'd be late for work and it's like they come blowing by and they're mad and you see and you're like, well you should have got up earlier. Ain't my fault you're late for work. You've done that to yourself. Come on. But what happens is that person, we need to realize that God, sometimes when you in situations, God protects you and keeps you. And quit always being the first to complain. Sometimes be the first one to praise. Come on. The first one to say, you know what, glory to God, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what other people think. I thank God in the middle of this situation, right in the middle of this storm, praise be to God. Glory and honor to Jesus. And I can tell you that the Bible says the devil, if you resist him, will have to flee. The only person trying to get you to doubt God is the devil. And anybody he uses to try to convince you to doubt God is being used by who? The devil. So you have to be willing to say, you know what? That's not coming from God. God doesn't condemn. God convicts. Many times we forget in the church world as Christians... Well, I feel guilty about something I did or something that happened 20 years ago. Let me tell you this. That's not from God. God does not condemn you for your past. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been saved and set free. And God now wants you to live in today and in the future, realizing I'm going to walk every day in the covering of Christ Jesus and what He did at the cross of Calvary. My faith is in His finished work, in His shed blood, and now whatever hell brings my way I'm going to tell the devil and anybody who tries to be used of the devil that you know what it's alright because God's got this thing I'm not getting down I'm not going to be run over I'm not going to be put down I'm keeping my head up and wherever the, the things may lead you you've got to be happy it's like when I told my mama God called me to come to Houston build church she said, why you got to go to Houston? That's so far away. Can't you build one in Alabama, Florida, closer to me? I said, Mama, just thank God he didn't call me to India. <laughs> We'd be thankful for what we got. Thankful for the blessings that God gives us. Thankful for where God puts us at times. Because we may not understand what God is doing, but we have to say, you know what? Whatever it is. It, some of it may be caused by our own doing. Some of it may be caused by other people's doing. But we have to say it's okay. God knows, and God's going to bring me through this. You have to have that faith to know, my God's going to bring me through it. My God's going to bring me through it. It's just like somebody, if they tell you you got cancer, and I'm sure that probably every person that's ever had cancer has probably thought, well, why me? Why me? Other people don't have cancer. Why me? Let me tell you something. That's the time you had to say, you know what, God? I know one thing. One thing only. And that is that I gave you my life. I placed my faith in you. 
And whatever I go through, whatever I'm going to endure, I know that when it's all said and done, that you said in Revelations, you will wipe away every tear and every sorrow. I know that I have a place in heaven. And because of that, even though I feel like I'm down and beaten today and the doctor says there's no hope, I know that I have the hope because I will only die to this flesh one time and then I will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Oh, come on, you ain't getting it. Somebody say it. Forever, forever, forever and forever he will bring you through those situations and you can have victory because of your faith in who not in yourself not in your neighbor not in your preacher but you can have faith in god almighty who is holy righteous pure and worthy to be praised well come on give the lord a hand clap of praise this morning I'm going to read you that, Revelations chapter 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There's many times you can let yourself be beat down. Let people beat you down. People can be used by the devil so many times. And if we allow it, it'll continue. Come on. You know, that's why when I was a kid, I didn't have a problem with bullies. Because I wasn't a bully. The reason I didn't have a problem with bullies is because if a bully came at me, you know what I did? I punched him in the nose. That's just the way I was. I wanted to be a boxer. Because I liked fight when I was a little boy. And I wanted to be a boxer so bad. You know, I watch him box. I, was, I could do that. I could, I could do that. I know I could. And so finally one time I went down to sign up for baseball. And they had boxing registration going on right beside the box. I said, ooh, I'm going to do boxing. I signed up for boxing at the YMCA. Got home, Mom and Daddy said, did you sign up for baseball today? I said, no. Ma'am, no, sir. And they said, why not? I said, because I signed up for boxing. <laughs> so, what? You're not going to, my mom, you're not going to box. You No, know, there ain't no way you're going to box. They wouldn't let me box. So I had to go and unsign up and had to sign back up for baseball. But I wanted to box. I wasn't ever afraid to box somebody. No. You know, when the devil knows you're scared to call on the name of Jesus, he'll keep coming at you. When he knows he can get you down easy and make you discouraged and quit, he's going to come and jump on your back. Now, I ain't trying, I, I know a lot of people don't like this kind of talk, but this is the way I was when I was a kid, and this still carries off in my Christian walk and the way I serve God. I remember we had, I got in a little deal with some of my buddies with some boys that were older. I was in seventh grade every ninth grade. And we got in a little, thing through a football game on a Saturday where a seventh graders had beat the ninth graders and they were mad. And so I got to school and me and my sister had just parted ways. She went down a different hallway for a class and I was going. And there was a group of guys walking. I went around them like this beside the locker. And when I did, somebody hit me with their forearm and threw me up against the lockers. Well, my first reaction was, I took my books and I whacked that guy over the back of the head. When he turned around, I realized he was one of those guys that were ninth graders. I was a little seventh grader. He was about twice my size. And he beat me back over the other lockers. But as soon as he turned around, I went and jumped on his back. And I was hitting him in the back of the head as hard as I could. And he would ram me in them lockers and I would fall off of him and he would try to get away and I would go back after him again and jump on his back. It's like a spider monkey on him. The reason I tell you that is because when the devil comes at you, don't be afraid to fight back. Amen? You ain't got to swing punches. You don't have to do any of that. But what you do is you say in the name of Jesus Christ and by His power and by His authority, I come against you, devil, in the name of Jesus, the name above all names that every devil trembles at. 
and you have victory through whatever you're facing. And you say, my God's going to bring me through. Hallelujah. And the devil comes to you. I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus. I can tell you how many times over 25 years of ministry. It's a joke among preachers that every preacher resigns every Monday and decides to stay where he's at on Tuesday. Why? Because people didn't amen enough. Come on. People didn't uh, say good sermon. Or maybe some people got ugly with you and mad with you. You never know. I can tell you, some of the ugliest people you ever meet is in church. I don't mean visually ugly. Their spirits can be ugly. But I can say this. What, what has kept me over the years is I just continue to say, you know what? I know my God's bigger than all that foolishness. Come on. My God's bigger than all the things that are coming against me. And I'm going to keep walking. And that's where every one of you should be. When somebody is, is letting their self be attacked by hell... All they do is become a discouragement, what? To others. But when you're an encouragement means, you do what? You put your faith in Christ and you never waver. Now, who is God going to be able to bless or use more? One that wavers? Every time the sea toss, come on. Or somebody who holds on. When we was, first boat I ever owned with my children, we bought this little old boat. I was up preaching and somewhere up in Texas, and we bought, I bought a boat and brought it back. And it had one of them walk-through glass deals where you, the glass opens up and there's a little sitting area up front. And it was an old 1970-something boat, but I was proud of it. But it stalled out there once in a while, and you couldn't get the crank back up. It, you know, but once, one day we decided we are going to go on the lake, and we're going to get out there and break the kids. So we got down here right on 90 here, and we was... Uh, on the on the north side of the 1960, I mean, we was right on the north side, and we let in right there at the marina, and we're pulling along that little old boat, and we go under the bridge, and to the, to the south side of it, and when we did, there was waves. I promise you, four or five foot high coming, and all of a sudden Chase was sitting at the front looking back at me. The wave came over his little head and washed him to the back of the boat. I'm going to tell you, I panicked. I thought we was going down. My kids were washing her on the, the boat. The waves were crashing. I'm turning and I'm thinking, oh God, don't let this thing stall out. Don't let this thing stall out now. And I got it back over there into the calm water. And I, we, we call that our deadliest catch moment. And I, I asked him, I said, what do y'all want to do now? They said, we want to go home. I want to go home. Well, that's what the devil wants you to do. Come on. Now, I had no sense because it was my kids involved. You know what I did? I went and loaded the boat up and we went home. But in life, just because you hit some four or five footers or 12 footers or 40 footers or 50 footers or 60 footers, you can't just give up. When you're out in the storm, you got to stay afloat. Come on. You got to keep going and you got to keep fighting and you got to believe that God on the other side of that storm is peace and you know there always is. A, a hurricane is massive if it is. It's only so big. Your trial, your tribulation is only going to be so big. Your time that you're going through difficulty is only going to be so big. But you remember God's still above those clouds and He's at the other side of that storm and He's going to bring you through and you will have victory. Why? Because God has provided the victory for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap praise as you stand this morning, would you? <laughs> praise God. Praise God. I wonder how many of you say today, you know what? I'm not going to let the devil beat me down. I'm not going to let the devil keep me from having the victory that I know God has for me. I'm going to walk faithful. I'm going to continue to press forward. I'm holding my faith in God. No matter what everybody else does, I'm keeping my faith in God. I'm going to keep my faith in God.